Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 26, we're going to roll a few 6550 and KT88 tubes. We're going to try to do two things at the same time. We're going to have our first look at the 6550 and KT88, and we're going to use the Wilsonton R8 for the reviews. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. Before we get into reviewing tubes, let's get the tube data sheets out and see what the differences are between the EO34, 6550 and the KT88. Okay, up first is the EO34. Now this is the original Muller data sheet, not the reissue. So VA max is anode voltage max or plate voltage max, same thing. Let's get our pointer out. 800 volts. 25 watts is the maximum that the, um, that the tube can dissipate safely. And IK, which is uh, cath I is current, K stands for the cathode, so that's cathode current maximum 150 milliamps. Okay, next let's grab the 6550. So this is the original Tungsol, not the reissue. Now Tungsol invented the 6550 back in 1954. Phillips invented the EO34 in 1949. And of course, Philip's own Muller. That's why we were looking at the Muller data sheet. So maximum ratings, design maximum values. No fooling around here. Plate voltage DC, 660. So a little lower than the, the, the Muller version, or the EO34. Plate dissipation, nice clear language. I love tongue solid data sheets. 42 watts. So a little bit higher, quite a bit higher actually than the, the EO34. Cathode current 190 milliamps and just a little bit higher than the than the EO34. Uh, let's look at the KT88. Okay, this is the original GEC data sheet from June of 1961. I know that because it says right down here. Now GEC, that's General Electric UK invented the KT88 in 1956. And the K stands for kinkless, believe it or not. There, there was a problem in the uh, performance of the tube. And it showed up um, on the plot of the tube and it looked like a kink. And um, they figured out how to wind the grids in such a way that they could make a kinkless um, output of the tube. As, and as a result, they were so proud of it, they, they used, used the K right in the designation because it was a huge innovation. It was a technological innovation, basically, or a manufacturing innovation. So what are our maximums? Look, at this is fun. Absolute and design maximum. So if you were designing a tube for the loudest rock and roll band in history, would you go with the design maximum or the absolute? I, yeah, I'm with you. You'd go absolute, maybe even a little bit more. Anyways, I'm conservative. I, I would stick on this side of the line, but anyways. So 800 volts. And so that's quite a bit higher than the 6550. But what, what is our, our maximum watts? Our maximum watts is 42 absolute and 35 design, which is roughly what the 6550 is. In fact, 42 is what Tungsol says that they output. 230 milliamps on the cathode is a little bit higher than the 6550. So the 6550 and the KT88 are actually very similar tubes. So what's going on here? In fact, the L 34 was introduced in 49, the 6550 in 54, and then the KT88 in 56. What happened was Phillips made a huge innovation with the EO34, small envelope, high-powered tube, 
um, that sounded amazing. And of course, um, they had the patent on it. They, they had the lock on uh, the Pento design. And the only thing their competitors could do was to innovate to get around the patent rules. So let's take a look at that. Hopefully you can see this. So here's the beginning of tube design, a triode, simple three parts, plate, grid, and cathode. We move next into what's called a tetrode. Now, tetros had problems, so they, they weren't commonly, the design wasn't commonly adopted for, for tube manufacture, but basically they, they added a screen. Now, what that screen does is it helps to control all the electrons. Remember, the plate has a large high voltage, and we're negative down here at the cathode. So when you heat up the cathode, the electrons come flying at high speed. They want to be attracted here. That's, that's their job. They got no choice. They come flying at the plate, and a lot of them come bouncing all over the place. Well, the screen is to help control that. Okay, so next along comes Phillips and the EL34 and the Pento design. And look what they've done. They put something called a suppressor grid. Now, it's hard to remember these things. This is properly called a control grid. That's where your audio signal goes on. You have your screen grid, which we just talked about. And now we have something called a suppressor grid. And they've, that's commonly tied down either internally in the tube to the cathode or externally you tie it to the cathode. These two grids are basically doing very much the same thing as to what the tetrode screen was trying to do, and that is to control all these electrons that are flying around. Now, what are you going to do if you're a huge manufacturer and you want a high-powered small envelope power tube? Well, you're going to invent something, and this was a huge innovation Along the similar lines to what the Phillips uh, EO34 was, they came up with something called the beam-powered tetrode. And they depict it here, but let's look over here and see what it actually looks like. So let's start way at the beginning, in the middle. So in the middle is the cathode, and what's not commonly shown is your heater filament which runs right up the middle here, there, you're going to find various shapes and configurations, but essentially the heater's got to be literally on top of, or the cathode's got to be around the heater element, because in order for the tube to function, the cathode's got to get extremely hot, and the heater does that. So, you heat up the cathode, and they depict here the grid wires, and that's all they are, is wires that are wrapped around the cathode. Now the size of the wire, the make, the, the what the metal, metal urgy of the wire is, the diameter, the number of the wraps, all of that determines the, um, all of the parameters of the tube. How much output it's going to have, how efficient the tube is, what it's going to sound like, and this is the tricky bit, folks. These wires, that's where the K and the KT88 comes from, is they came up with a, a refined way of wrapping these wires so that they worked much more efficiently without a problem in the output. And they actually called it kinkless because the, the output, um, if you were to, to, to scope the output, there is actually a problem, a kink, in the actual power output of the tube. And uh, kinkless got rid of that, and it had a much smoother transition of power. Okay, so what are they showing here? They're showing beam plates helping to focus the flow of electrons onto the plate. That's, that's all it is. That's what a beam-powered tetrode is. That's the 6V6, the 6L6, the 6550, the KT88. So what does that give us? It gives us efficiency. So we can have higher power in the same basic envelope. And 
Best of all, it's a unique patent, so it gets us around Philips lock on uh, highly efficient small envelope power tubes. Okay, enough of that. Up first, we've got the Electroharmonix 6550. Let's have a quick look at them. We've got a large rectangular plate structure, three big holes. We've got an upper mica and of course a chrome dome. So we know above that third mica and the third mica is is a shield. It helps make the two more rigid. But we know there's getters up there. Maybe a pair. It's hard to tell. I, I, I don't have any tubes in which the gettering is worn off because they're all brand new. So anyways, that might be a good thing. In fact, I bought a big lot of 6550 um, Electroharmonix. They're all dated uh, 2001. And they're nice. They're really nice solid tubes. Um, okay. And of course, with the KT88 6550s, uh, they pretty much all came with nice metal bases, which years ago was a mil spec um, signature. It made for a much solid, more solid tube. But later on, the big power tubes like the KT88 just simply built them all with metal bases. Okay, so how did they sound? Base was very good, plus nice tone, good detail, a touch forward, rich and full. Mid-range was good, but definitely not clean, clear, and crisp, as I like to say. So what then? It sounded good, but somehow it was a little restricted or not so expansive, not well-defined. I'm honestly at a loss to say what I was hearing that I didn't like, because it did sound good. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Treble was very good, minus... Something not quite right as well. In fact, it sounded a bit short on finish. That's a similar problem with the Electroharmonix EL34s. So it could be a materials issue, um, or a design issue, or both. These tubes had good detail and an excellent soundstage. In fact, the soundstage was very holographic. I was really quite taken with it. Holographic means a soundstage positions the the music as you would imagine it on the stage. So typically the drums are back, maybe up a little bit, centered. You would have, let's say, your bass guitar, in the case of the Who, uh, stage right would be uh, Ent Whistle, and um, Daltrey would be front, forward, and center, and Pete Townsend would be stage left, um, on the Gonzo guitar, of course. Um, uh, yeah. You can tell I was a Who fan. I still am a Who fan, actually. In fact, of all the groups that I followed back in the 70s, I would have to say that the Who have consistently put out the best sound quality in their later part of their career. I don't know if any of them can hear, but they have enough brains to hire good engineers because um, the sound quality of um, their last... A uh, pair of live CDs was just absolutely awesome. It blew me away. Okay, <laughs> I digress. So, um, I was pondering, what's going on with these tubes? Because they're not sounding the best with my, my standard test tracks. Now, I don't put high-powered rock and roll on as a test track, generally speaking. I will try a whole bunch of music, including prog rock, but it's not in my uh, detailed examination of the tube. I just want to see in general how the tube does with various types of music. So, on went Boston's first album. The remaster version, the first song, Four Play Long Time, one of my favorite rock songs. And wow, the music just popped. The detail worked for the amazing recording by Tom Schultz, the genius behind Boston. And the soundstage was very nice as well. Okay, we're going to talk more about that. Let's move on. Up next we've got the same manufacturer, branded Gold Lion KT88s. So both those tubes, 
Both of these tubes are made by New Sensor of New York. They're built in Russia at the uh, old reflector plant. And now reflector, Russian reflector tubes were rock solid, really good quality tubes. And um, the tradition continues with the new sensor tubes. Um, they're nice tubes, they're well made, they're decent sounding tubes. Um, and you don't see the spec of the tubes. I do a lot of tube testing. I te In a week I could test a thousand tubes in a busy week. Um, so I can get a real handle on how good the manufacturing quality control is, especially on new tubes. When I bring in a box of 6550s, um, I get to see a whole section of the uh, production run. And um, I've been consistently impressed with the quality of these tubes. Okay, so let's just compare them. Look at that. They're really, really similar tubes. In fact, I dug up the data sheet and it's really inconclusive as to what's going on because this is actually lower rated than this, the 6550, and it should be, I think, the other way around. Now, the same basic sound signature as the Electroharmonix 6550 came out in the Gold Line KT88s. And I'm suspecting that they're actually very much the same tube, or very, very similar tube. I did the same thing when I felt that the tubes weren't quite doing it with my regular test tracks, and they did the same thing that the Electroharmonix tubes did. So it's really quite interesting because I love the look of these tubes, and these are really pretty plain Janes. So if you dress up a tube, maybe you can ask more money for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, these are an interesting example. These are um, these are vintage 6550s. So, let's take a look at the test numbers on these. So, this is a GE. Let's roll it over so you can see it. And I actually bought uh, for some money uh, a matched what was supposed to be a matched quad. And these two tubes are actually quite close. They're within my 5% that I like for close matching. Um, but let's look at another pair from that same quad. Another GE and RCA. Look at those numbers. Now the GM is not off too much, but look at the current on this tube. It only passed 18 milliamps. This sucker here was going nuts at 56 and a more reasonable 31 and 35. That's not a matched quad, folks. Now, I plug them in, I bias them on the R8, and I listen to them, and I've got to say, some of the closed-in feeling I was getting from, I wouldn't say it was closed-in, it was, it was just a different sound that I was getting from the um, new sensor tubes, it wasn't present in the vintage tubes. The bass is really lacking, but when you have tubes that are that far off, um, there's no way to tell whether the, the tubes are pushing good bass or not. Now, even though they're branded GE and RCA, these, in fact, I'm pretty sure were made by Tungsol. In fact, Tungsol made a lot of 6550s and rebranded it for everybody. <laughs> it's just, back in the day, that's what happened. If, if you didn't have the rights to the 6550 and Tungsol did, given they invented it. They were happy to make tubes for everybody and charge you for it, of course, and then you could brand your own 6550s. And I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Okay, so what have I, what have I learned from this? Well, I've got to think that this is a prime example of how one type of tube really suits a certain type of music. Or a better way to say it would be EL34s on the R8 are really nice with so small ensemble, acoustic jazz, classical, and folk. I run them in triode mode. The level of detail, soundstage, and overall sound quality is really nice. And to get that, you don't even need to spend the big bucks. You can buy the Electroharmonix EL34 EHs, and you'll get 90% there. 
On the other hand, if you're a rock and roller and you like your music coming at you like a hurricane, you are definitely going to prefer the 6550s or KT88s. And you don't even need to spend serious money. Just like the EL34, the Electro Harmonix 6550 will get you mostly there for very little money. In fact, the one thing I really loved about the Electro Harmonix 6550s was how expansive the sound was. And this really suited rock music. Okay, before we go, let's take a look at what came in this week. A whole bunch of really sweet 6080s with the metal bass, so mill spec. This is a really unique tube that has found a modern use in headphone amplifiers that are OTL. So they, they have uh, no output transformer. The, um, the, the, the output tube couples directly with your headphones through um, a capacitor. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Um, uh, just trying to remember... Bottlehead, um, I think, made this quite famous. There were designs prior to Bottleheads, of course, but they, I think they've made um, kit um, headphone amplifiers. Um, the, they've, they've taken it to a new level. They've got something called the Crack, I think, that people are really in love with. Anyways, a whole bunch of these, and I was really happy to find whole bunch of the earlier 6080s. They're called 6AS7Gs. Basically the same tube. This is in the ST type bottle or people commonly call them Coke bottles. And this is our Marconi. And um, you can see here there's your flat plate. And um, I have enough of them that I probably can match up pairs if anybody needs pairs. But this is a dual section twin tube, so it's actually two tubes in one envelope. So for many headphone amplifiers, they actually don't use more than one of these tubes, one, one half for the right channel and one half for the left channel. Okay, what else came in? Oh, some beautiful 807s. Now, what the heck is that? That is a, a top cap or an anode cap. So the high power connection, the B plus, goes up here. That gets it off down here. That allows this this tube. The 807 is a early high powered um, output tube, and um, it's essentially a six a high powered version of the 6L6, which of course is a very common um, amplifier output tube. This particular one, this 807, says right on it, made in Great Britain. You've heard me say, red alert, <laughs> red alert. I actually just went into the bag. They're, they're not tested yet, so they're not in the store. I, I just actually finished modifying one of my testers for the 807 because they take a unique five pin base. It's called a five pin US base. Let me grab one. I've got one right here for you. Here you go. I just put these in the store. And it looks a lot like the um, the modern. E um, uh, I've lost I'm lost words. The modern 300B base is very similar to this. Of course, 300B has four pins, and this has five. Anyways, it's got a unique base. Um, so even though one of my uh, main testers uh, can test a 606, and this will test at the same numbers, I believe, as a 6L6. I actually have to install a new socket on that tester, and on the other one I have to I have to do the same thing as well. So hopefully I can get that done over the weekend and we'll get these into the store. But let's get back to this. Have we got a real mullet, folks? Let's find, let's see if the codes are legible. I don't know if you can see them or not. Let's see if I can get it on camera for you. There's your codes. If you can't see them, there's a lovely big B at the beginning of the bottom bottom line. So that tells us Blackburn. So that tells us right away that even though it's branded Phillips, Phillips owned Mullard. In fact, it was made at the Mullard plant in uh, the Blackburn Mullard plant in the UK. 
Okay, well that was fun. If you stay to the end, here's some discount codes for you. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Bowles and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.